Sometimes I know I become all oh, that's weak in a man and weak in a boy. But I keep trying and I won't quit, and that must be worth something more. Touring has been the biggest part of my musical life, really, for the last you know 11 years, and when I started. It was really, really hard, you know? I was, it was super low budget, so we were crashing on people's floors. We stayed in caravan parks instead of hotels. Um, you know, sometimes we just, we'd drive home for four hours after a show to save money. Um, and it was, it was hard, and we we're also playing with bands that weren't necessarily appropriate. But once I had a couple of things, you know, kick off on Triple J, more people would start to come to the shows. And when I signed to Ivy League, I did a thing called the Tri-State Residency, which was a real big success. It was we I did uh, three states in three nights every week. So I did Melbourne, Sydney, and then either Adelaide or Brisbane every every week for a month. Uh, and you know, when I first started playing, there would be ten people there, and by the end of it, all the, all the shows were sold out. It was a huge thing, and from that point, things started to kick off. Then I, I remember playing the big day out um, back in 2006, um, and there was way more people than I was expecting to be there. And then I kicked off that very same afternoon. Uh, I was number 19 in the hottest 100 with Middle of the Hill, and I literally went from that big day out, jumped in a car, drove to Queensland to start a, a tour with a Canadian artist. And from there, it was just all on, it was just like, I was away all the time. And then when I got signed to Ireland in the UK, the international start, stuff started kicking off. And in that first year of 2007, I think it was, I calculated that I was away, I slept in hotel room beds, I slept in not my own bed um, for 76% of the year. Um, you know, and this was at the same, exactly the same point that I'd also just moved in with my girlfriend who's now my wife. So it was a tough time, you know. I was away pursuing this exciting stuff, but I was kind of torn the whole time. Uh, and that feeling of being torn, I guess, was what influenced, you know, most of the writing for Chimneys of Fire, which songs like The Lighthouse Song, uh, Where Two Oceans Meet, and all those songs that kind of refer to this being split in two and, you know, loving what you're doing, but also wanting to be somewhere else at the same time, um, is all, all a reflection of how my life had turned into this touring, traveling machine kind of thing. Uh, and it's something that I still struggle with, but I, I'm also completely addicted to it. I absolutely love touring. So it's, uh, it's finding the balance, which has always been the, the difficult thing in, in, in life as well as in, you know, in my musical career. So obviously when I started going to the UK, um, things like uh, Middle of the Hill and stuff had already been on the radio a lot and you know, Private Education was the next single and it was all going really well. Um, and so when I started in the UK, I was starting from scratch again, but I was starting with the, the full weight of this international record label behind me. So it was, it was a really exciting time, you know, I, I was doing TV over there and, and shooting film clips over there um, and everything was... It was pretty big. Ivy League's been amazing. They were an amazingly supportive label, but they're an indie label, so you know, small budgets. And then I headed over to the UK, and it was like I was being picked up in in limousines to go to places, and you know, being flown around the country, and it was it was kind of crazy, and it was an amazing experience to feel that. But at the same time, I never felt quite comfortable because I knew that the more money they spent, the more pressure there was to perform for them and to be a kind of cold play successful artist, and that just wasn't what I wanted to do, you know, like as a musician I wanted to be organic and authentic and not write with an agenda, not think about what was going to get played on the radio and just write music. So I made the decision not to move to the UK and I made the decision that I would just go back and forth and back and forth. So for that first year of touring it was absolutely brutal and the only way to balance it was to just put my head down and work. And I got sick and I lost my voice. I was chronically on antibiotics, had a resurgence of glandular fever and, and I was you know, also really taken with the, <laughs> the touring life of drinking too much and started partying too hard. So it was, a, it was a tough year to balance that. But as I felt you know, both territories kind of coming up through the ranks, um, it seemed to be working, you know? Um, and so that first year was, was really exciting and I would go from playing you know, things like Splendor in Australia and playing to a packed 
tent to playing to you know a couple of hundred people in London, then you know 300, then 400, and then at the end of that year, I was playing to sort of 500 people in in, in the UK. Everything was kind of building up to this point, and then I found out that I was going to play Glastonbury at the end of the year, um, or at sort of mid-year, um, and I was blown away. It was so exciting because obviously it's you know it's a seminal it's a seminal festival, and so leading into this festival, I was pretty exhausted. And we got there, we 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 took a camper van onto the site and that's what we stayed in um and but when i got there it was just bucketing down with rain and there was it was muddy and it was crazy and then we started playing and i was like oh nobody's gonna come because it's, it's pissing down you know and then slowly people started to come up and come up and come up and then by the end of it, it was it was a pretty good crowd far bigger than i was expecting and people were singing the songs and i realized that all the work that i'd done throughout the course of that year was starting to pay dividends and so we finished the show, it was in, in the day, and we just had a massive night cruising around Glastonbury, ending up in what's called the Healing Fields, um, with gypsies selling us nitrous oxide in balloons, and, uh, and just have, you know, just kind of reflecting on this crazy night and crazy day, and you know, at that point, a really crazy year up to that point. And then I literally flew back and went straight into playing Splendor, which was just a whole, whole other ball game, and you know, I, I kind of realized that maybe things were at a point where it was going to be my proper job for, for quite a while now.